current technology. So it's something we keep an eye on, but um, I, I don't think that, you know, we're very fortunate in Colorado. We've got access to cheap gas. Uh, we've got a fantastic wind resource. Uh, solar energy uh, seems to have a cost decay curve that's uh, beating nukes cost decay curve. In fact, if you look at solar energy today, um, I think you could make the argument that solar uh, photovoltaics are actually cheaper than nuke energy. Not the same product, you know, you don't have solar at night, but, um, you know, it doesn't seem, based on our current outlook, that it's going to be a cost-effective technology uh, in the short term. TJ, can you comment on um, the debate over fracking? Uh, it's definitely out of my area of expertise. I can share a little bit about um, the administration's perspective. You know, the governor is a former oil and gas geologist, so usually when we talk about fracking, it's him teaching me stuff uh, about it as opposed to me advising him. And fracking is primarily the uh, regulatory domain of the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, run by Dave Neslin and housed within the Department of Natural Resources, uh, which is run by Mike King. Uh, but I will tell you, I will share what, I, what I, my perspective is or what, you know, from the administration's perspective that we have. Um, you know, fracking, it's, we believe the technology can be inherently safe. Uh, so, and we think that Colorado, or we've been, we've gotten the feedback that Colorado's uh, rules and regulations around fracking are some of the best in the country, if not the best in the country, and a model for other parts of the country. A lot of the concerns about it um, don't seem to make sense uh, on its face. You know, the, the idea that the chemicals that we inject 7,000 feet into the ground will then seep back up to the groundwater, which is a couple hundred feet uh, at most below uh, the, the surface, uh, there just doesn't seem to be a, a clear hypothesis of how that actually happens. Um, but at the same time, we do really care about our well water. And so the governor has, and the, and the OGCC have tried to be very aggressive to say, okay, we have concerns about well water, we have concerns about, about our water supply, we will make sure that we preserve that and protect that. With fracking, maybe the issue isn't the chemicals that go on the ground, but it could be issues around surface handling. We sure the heck don't want, you know, a, a drum to fall off the back of a truck and, and get into groundwater that way. And so um, in order to address this fundamental issue, not the means again, but the ends, uh, the governor recently announced with the Colorado Oil and Gas Association a voluntary well water baseline testing program. So if uh, consumers have, or, or sorry, if, uh, if uh, people have, landowners have con concerns about what's happening with their well water, um, there'll be a baseline to say, okay, this is how much methane was in your water before, these are the baseline chemicals. Now that you've had a, a frack uh, rig, you know, within a, a mile or a quarter mile or, or whatever from your house, now we can check and see if that's changed anything. Uh, because, you know, we don't know absolutely and we definitely care about having clean water and clean air and so we will, we will check that. But again, you know, my questions about, about shale gas are more about the total quantity that we have available. Um, it's not knowable, really, because it's all uh, competitive information from each developer. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it looks pretty favorable right now. And uh, I think uh, shale gas is going to be a huge boon. I mean, if you compare the opportunity to transition from coal uh, and gasoline uh, or coal and oil into natural gas, uh, the overall environmental benefit is just huge. So we're, we're excited about trying to make sure that we extract that safely, and we think we can. One more question. Larry Gloss. Uh, you just started to mention the uh, comparisons or cost-benefit analysis from coal to natural gas. How does that play out for the power plants uh, throughout the state and the surrounding um, states? Could you address that? So in the state of Colorado, I think it's important, you know, we talk about the cheapest source of energy. A lot of folks talk about coal, um, and we get coal for about on a marginal cost basis or what, you know, existing coal plant, how much does it cost to get electricity out of that coal? About $20 per megawatt hour, uh, which, is, which is really cheap. I mean, it's two cents of your electric bill. Uh, you know, you guys probably pay an average of 10 cents. I know I, I'm an Excel uh, customer. I pay about 10 cents. Well, actually, I have solar on my roof, so I don't pay much of anything, but, um, but you, they charge about 10 cents for any, any kilowatt hour that I would use. Um, and about 20% of that is a generation when it comes from coal. Um, natural gas is uh, currently about 350 to $4 per million BTU. If you do a quick conversion, you know, that ends up to being in the $35 a megawatt hour or $30 a megawatt hour range. Um, so a little more expensive. And then if you compare wind energy, historically wind contracts have been escalating in price um, and a 
we had a couple wind farms come online this year that were probably in the, the $50 per megawatt hour, or five cents a kilowatt hour, $60, six cents a kilowatt hour. But that recently has changed, and now we have these new sources of energy coming on um, at uh, 32 cents was the latest contract that, or sorry, $32 a megawatt hour. So you have $20 per megawatt hour coal, you have mid 30s uh, to 40s gas, and you have $32 a megawatt hour wind. So wind energy, like I said, is, the, is, is a competitive resource. But that's not really apples to apples. Those numbers that I quoted to you are existing coal plants, existing gas plants, and new wind farms. If you look like to like, if you look at existing to existing, wind has very low marginal cost. There's no fuel, and there's some O&M that you would you know, say you'd put in there. You could shut the thing down or abandon the plant, and you wouldn't have that O&M cost. But that's on the order of, of a couple dollars per megawatt hour. So an existing to existing, wind is the cheapest. And new to new, wind ends up being the cheapest as well. If we look at $32 per megawatt hour um, for, a, for a new wind farm, and we look at gas, our estimates come in in the 50s. There's a lot of assumptions into this number. But long term, we think a, 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 for 10 years or 20 years, a gas plant would end up costing us $50 per megawatt hour. And a new coal plant is going to be in the high 60s to low 70s. That's what Comanche, the coal plant in Pueblo that came on last year, came in at. So now that... $30 a megawatt hour price is a subsidized price. There's subsidies across the energy space. Um, if I strip out the big subsidy, the, the most distorting, uh, quote unquote, mark, uh, subsidy for wind, that bumps the price up to 50. So we have $50 wind, low 50s to, to uh, oh, sorry, medium 50s to high 60s gas, and uh, high 60s to low 70s coal on a new to new resource. So that's, that's the perspective we use. And there's lots of details in the numbers on fuel price and interest rates and capital costs and, and all sorts of things that we can talk about. And there's no externalities that are priced into that or anything like that. TJ, thank you very much. Thank you. And if I could just say, say and I just, again, want to, want to thank uh, you guys for all the work you do, the service work, and, and helping build our, institute, our state to be a greater state. Um, the governor really, really emphasizes collaboration. He sometimes takes uh, hits for uh, not wanting to take positions on things because he really does believe that the, all the institutions in the state of Colorado are what's going to drive our success going forward, not mandates from above. So uh, thank you. Please continue the work, and here's another 100 years for you guys.